Maybe you've heard this armchair diagnosis from a friend or a coworker. Man, that girl has real daddy issues. <laughs> ever, heard that, ever heard that phrase? Wow, she has real daddy issues. Or maybe, dude, you've got to get over your daddy issues. Just what are daddy issues? Well, one online definition that I found goes something like this. Daddy issues is an informal term generally referring to the trouble some people have with forming secure relationships in adulthood based on an early unhealthy connection or lack thereof with their father. Now, that's not a clinical term. Clinicians would talk about uh, attachment disorder, attach, unhealthy attachment or healthy attachment. Uh, but it's describing something real in these, in these instances. Whatever you think of that armchair diagnosis of daddy issues, it wouldn't be surprising if the ancient opponents of Jesus applied a similar label to him. You have daddy issues. But the daddy issues, of course, that infuriated many of the Jewish leaders had nothing to do with Jesus' upbringing, had nothing to do with his ability to form healthy attachment. Their concern was blasphemy. Blasphemy stemming from the way that Jesus talked about God as his father. Were their concerns justified? What did Jesus actually believe about his relationship with God? Let's dig into those questions this morning. Let's try to figure that out by going to John chapter 5. Uh, we're going to start this morning, if you're open there, open to John chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 19. That's where we left off last time. Before we begin in verse 19, let me remind you, most of you already remember, but let me remind you about the circumstances that led up to this passage that we lo we're looking at this morning. So verses 1 through 15, you can skim over those. Verses 1 through 15, we read about Jesus healing a man who had been lame or paralyzed, some kind of affliction, uh, mobility affliction. Uh, he had been lame for 38 years. But this miracle that Jesus performed, it took place on the Sabbath. And because it took place on the Sabbath, as we see in verse 16, some of the Jewish leaders took issue with Jesus' actions. They took issue with Jesus. Before we read our main passage this morning, it's important to point out that the teaching that Jesus declares beginning in verse 19, is in response to what we see in verse 18, what we heard in verse 18. Look again at verse 18. What does it say? It says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, in their estimation, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So, listen to how Jesus addresses that, that accusation. Listen to how Jesus addresses their, their concern. Verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. 
Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, there is a lot there, isn't there? <laughs> there is a lot of stuff there. Uh, we're going to try to tackle as many ideas as we can, but it's thick. There's lots of things that, as one ancient, I think it was Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, John the Golden Mouth is what that means. John the Golden Mouth, one of the church fathers who said, the Gospel of John is like, a, is like water that a, a baby could play in, but it's also like water in which an elephant could drown. Wow. So you know the depth that's, that's here in terms of going deeper. We'll do our best, though, this morning. First of all, here's what I want you to do. And for the sake of, of us as God's people, in terms of comprehension, of understanding what God has communicated here, I want you to notice three times in this passage that Jesus uses what expression? Truly, truly, right? Truly, truly. Now, what exactly does that mean? We'll get this out of the way right away because I think it's important up front. I think that it means something like this. Pay attention to my words. You can be sure of this. That's my long version of it. But I think that's the sense. Can you imagine Jesus Christ saying that to you as you're standing there in his presence? Pay attention to my words. You can be sure of this, that the Son of Man, or whatever he goes on to say, right, in these verses. Now, this is not the first place that Jesus has used this formulation in the Gospel of John. But it's important to recognize right from the outset the authority with which Jesus spoke. He didn't speak as the, as the, as the scriptures record people's uh, observation or people's response to him and his teaching, he spoke like no one had spoken before. He spoke with, with authority that these people had never heard before, and we need to recognize that as well. Jesus isn't just one other voice in the, in the chorus of history or the chorus of spiritual teachers or philosophers. He is the voice, isn't he? He is the voice, authoritative. So, this morning as we dig into and listen to this authoritative voice, I'd like to suggest that Jesus in this passage, this thick passage, is talking to these Jewish leaders about three things. Take a look. First, he's talking about the Son as Son. The Son as Son. Number two, he's talking about the Son as Judge. And number three, he's talking about the Son as Life Giver. The Son as Son the Son as judge, and the Son as life giver. So you may have noticed that verse 19 and verse 30 both begin with the same idea. Do you see that? 19 and 30. Take a look at those. They both begin with the same idea. 19 puts it this way. The Son can do nothing of his own accord. Verse 30 puts, puts it this way. I can do nothing on my own. So those are, those are our bookends this morning, aren't they? They bracket our section, our, our passage. Your Bible may have a break at verse 29, and 30 is in a new section. I think that's a mistake. I think 30 is actually the conclusion 
what's called an inclusio. It, it brings it, it brackets it, and Jesus comes back to the first theme that he began with. The son can do nothing of his own accord. I can do nothing on my own. Both of these statements precede an explanation of Jesus, an explanation by Jesus that, that, that unpacks his relationship with the Father. Now, this is extremely important. This is what's usually not understood and usually what's lost generally on readers. It's important to understand that when Jesus is speaking here, he is not talking about God the Word, chapter 1, verse 1. He's not talking about God the Word or God the Son's relationship to the Father before the Incarnation. He's talking about his present relationship to God the Father as one who is both divine and human. We see that here. One who is both divine and human. One who is both, verse 25, the Son of God, and, verse 27, the Son of Man. Son of God, Son of Man. That's Jesus' present relationship with the Father. That is Jesus' word made flesh, but also Jesus, son of David, seed of David, king from David's line, son of Mary, right? Son of Joseph. Both of these are true. This is what's being emphasized. So what we find in verses 19 and 30 are not statements about God the Son's inferiority to the Father. That's not what's being expressed. Not at all. The focus here is instead on interdependence. Interdependence between the Father and the Son, the incarnate Son. Jesus wants to clarify for these men what his special relationship with the Father does and does not mean. Remember I said he's addressing what they were saying in verse 18? That's what, exactly what he's doing here. He's speaking to that. He's telling them this. I am not God's rival. I am God's son. I am not God's rival. I am God's son. And then he wants them to understand what that relationship looks like between father and son. This is what Jesus is doing. Like any healthy father-son relationship, the son looks to the father in order to father, follow the father's lead. He does this because, verse 20, the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Do you see the mutuality there? Do you see the connection, the relationship, the interdependence there? This is not God the Father begrudgingly trying to push away the little annoying son who's following him around, trying to, trying to get in his way and do all that he's doing. That's not what's happening. The Father loves the son. It's the Father's purpose to show the son everything that he's doing. And the, son, the son's love for the Father, the son's joy is in following the Father's lead and looking to the Father, hearing from the Father, seeing the Father. Remember the context. What is the context? The Son's controversial ministry of mercy on the Sabbath is in fact an expression of the Father's work. Isn't it? The Father who on uh, the seventh day of creation ceases from his creative efforts, but who maintains and upholds and preserves all living things every moment from there on out. The Father who has a, a purpose of grace, a purpose of redemption, who is carrying that purpose out and always has been. He is working, and the Son is doing likewise. The Son is bringing restoration, healing to this man. The Son is doing the work of the Father, the Father's mission of mercy. Jesus is not trying to overturn the divine order here. No, there is cooperation and unity between the Father and the Son. When you read back through that, knowing that, 
you read back through that, it just is obvious what he's telling them about this relationship. But notice the final statement in verse 20. Take a look at verse 20 again. Notice that final statement in verse 20 is a, transfer, is a transition from the healing of the lame man to something way, way, way bigger. We know that because Jesus says what? He calls them greater works. And greater works than these will the Father show the Son so that you may marvel. What are the greater works that the Father re will reveal to the Son? Well, this is where we move to the next point. The Son is judged. They are, these greater works are the closely related or we might say interconnected ideas of judgment and life-giving. What are the greater works? Judgment and life-giving. That's why we see that four, that's why we see that four in verse 21, the very beginning. What are the greater works? For as the Father raises the dead. Now, even though verse 21 does focus on life-giving, it's the first theme introduced, let me start with the idea of judgment instead. They're kind of interwoven here as you keep going down through the verses, the two themes. We find this emphasis on judgment in verses 22, 23, 27, and 30. Not only, so this is what we learn, not only will God the Father have the Son carry out his mission of mercy, which of course is exemplified by his healing on that Sabbath day. Jesus is carrying out the mission of, the, of mercy that the Father has entrusted to him. He will also have him, the Father will also have the Son carry out his mission of judgment. In fact, verse 22, the Father has given all judgment to the Son. Now, if you've ever read the Old Testament and you hear that, you should be shocked. That's a staggering statement. That the Father has given all judgment to the Son. The Apostle Paul confirms this greater work in Acts 17. I love the way Paul expresses it. Acts 17, verse 30. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Notice Paul's wording. God has appointed a man. God has appointed a man. This is Jesus, the Son of Man, of John chapter 5, verse 27. Jesus, the Son of Man. The Son of Man, a title that we first find as a title in Daniel chapter 7. An incredible vision of one coming before the Ancient of Days, a Son of Man. And what was he given? He was given all dominion. All power, all authority. What kind of kingdom did he have? What, was he given one that was unshakable, that would never be moved? This was the Son of Man. Hours before his crucifixion, Jesus would quote Daniel 7, that title, to the Jewish leadership, many of whom might be present right here in John chapter 5, talking with him. Some of these guys would later hear Jesus say this. Take a look at Mark 14, verse 62. When pressed, if he was, in fact, the Messiah, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Wow. Huge. No wonder it provoked the response that it did. This gives you a little bit of a sense of the scandalizing words that Jesus is saying here in John 5. The way that he's describing himself, his relationship to God. But think about the irony. Think about the irony here in John 5. These leaders of God's people are passing judgment on and condemning the one who has been appointed by God himself to judge. The one who will one day judge all people, including his opponents standing right in front of him. 
They're judging him. You see, Jesus has to, he wants them to understand. Don't you understand? Don't you understand what's happening here? You're getting all over me about this healing? Don't you understand my relationship to the Father? Don't you understand what the Father has entrusted me to do? That he's handed all judgment over to me? Clearly, something is terribly wrong here. Now, closely connected, point number three, the Son is life giver. The Son is Son, the Son is judge, the Son is life giver. Now, we see here, connected to this role of judge, is the Son's role as life giver. Though these opponents condemn the Son, without Him, ultimately they will be condemned themselves. Again, what Jesus is trying to say very clearly to them. They will be condemned without him, though they condemn him now. Only the Son can give them life. Only the Son can give you life. Do you believe that? Only the Son can give us life. These men who were uh, uh, attacking Jesus, these men understood what the Old Testament revealed. It was God who through the prophet Elijah raised to life the boy who had died in 1 Kings 17. It was God who through the prophet Ezekiel spoke about God's power to bring to life the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. It was God who would affect the resurrection described in Daniel chapter 12. The God of resurrection, the God of the Old Testament. But if these men in John 5 are more concerned about Sabbath infractions, if they're more concerned about those than a miraculous healing of a man lame for 38 years, what will they do when the Son's greater work of resurrection comes to pass? How will they, even understanding it, how, what will they do with this son's work of resurrection? For like his father, verse 21, the son gives life to whom he will. Just as the God of the Old Testament was a God of resurrection, Jesus says, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He'll say later, won't he, in John chapter 11. Did you hear in this passage this morning two kinds of resurrection? As Jesus was talking about himself as life giver, he describes two kinds of resurrection. The first kind of resurrection is the one to which most of us default. It, it's, the, it's the bodily resurrection, verses 28 and 29. That's clearly what Jesus is describing there. Resurrection, bodily resurrection, and then life. Or resurrection, bodily resurrection, and then judgment. And of course, in this passage, it's judgment leading to condemnation. That's implied. But Jesus describes another kind of resurrection in verses 24 and 25. Take a look. That end of the age resurrection I just mentioned will not, sorry, will, not surprisingly, it will take place, look at verse 28, at an hour that is coming. Your bodily resurrection, the bodily resurrection of every person who's ever lived on this planet will take place at an hour that's coming in the future. I don't know when. It could be later today. It could be next week. It could be next year. It could be three, five hundred years from now. I don't know. But this other resurrection will begin in a time that is, according to Jesus in verse 25, now here. He says it's right now, it's beginning now, it's now here. You see, when the spiritually dead hear the voice of the Son of God, they will live. Hallelujah. When the spiritually dead hear the voice of the Son of God, they will live. He will live. She will live. 4, verse 24. Here's the key verse in all of this tucked right in the very center of those bookends, that bracket, this passage, right in the dead center, verse 24, this is it. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. Why is that? Because he's passed from death to life. Has 
passed. Has passed from death to life. Already. Jesus is speaking here. And we, we don't want to miss this. We don't want to miss this any time in the Gospel of John. Whenever this happens. We don't want to miss this. Jesus is speaking the truth in love to these men. He's speaking the truth in love to them. Is that how you understand it? He's telling them the truth. He knows they desperately need to hear the truth. Do they need to be rebuked? Yes. <laughs> Do they need to be corrected? Yes. Do they need to be put in their place? Yes. But he does so absolutely in love because he's trying to help give them the bigger picture there. He wants them to understand that eternal life is available to them today. Today. It's available to them from the only one who can give it. Eternal life from God. But they must also believe that the Son is a life giver. That the Son is judge and that verse 30 his judgment is just you see clearly they don't believe that do they if they did believe that they would not be haranguing Jesus the way that they are they wouldn't be lording themselves over Jesus the way that they are he desperately wants them to understand the truth he wants them to connect the dots of what they just saw, of what there's evidence of that this man, 38 years lame, is now healed. Connect the dots, he tells them. Don't you understand? That's a portent of things to come. It's a sign of things to come, that there are greater works. I'm not just a miracle worker. I am judge and life giver. Talk about shocking for these men. God is judge god is life giver and they believe these men believe they are honoring god by opposing jesus don't they jesus understands that he knows the way that they're thinking but he wants them to see how those miraculous work that miraculous work points to the greater works he's crystal clear about why the son is also judge and life giver why is the son also judge and life giver why is that so significant verse 23 that all may honor the son just as they honor the father because whatever they might think Whatever they might believe about what they're doing and their motivation and the end of what they're doing, the design that they have for their actions, Jesus says clearly, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If they oppose Jesus, they are standing in opposition to God himself. That's how identified the Father and Son are. Jesus speaks the truth in love to these men who need to hear it. And he reveals staggering things. Things that you and I must accept as well. All of us, brothers and sisters, friends, all of us are called to honor Jesus Christ as judge and life giver. All of us are called to honor Jesus Christ as judge and life giver. Not just some nice guy that lived 2,000 years ago. Not just a great spiritual teacher, a man full of pithy wisdom, you know, sayings that were, uh, or a man who was willing to give his life for his friends just to show them how much he loved them, but he's somewhere dead or his body has been devoured by dogs or whatever. No, 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 no. We can't simply believe that about Jesus. We must believe that he is judge and life giver. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means accepting that the words of Jesus the judge are true. Words about my true spiritual condition. Words about what I truly deserve. Words about your true spiritual condition. Words about what you truly deserve. That you accept his judgment as just. It also means embracing him as your only hope for new life now and new life forever with God. And to stop looking in other places for that life. It's found in Christ alone. He's the life giver appointed by the Father. 
He has life in himself as the Father has life in himself. All of us are called to believe that by doing this, we are in fact honoring God the Father. This is how we pass from death to life. How can someone know though? How can someone know if they have passed from death to life? That's a good question, isn't it? It's an important question. How can someone know if truly eternal life is in their possession? Eternal life is one of those things we tend to think about as when I die, I'll, walk, I'll enter into eternal life. That's true in one sense, but it's also just as biblical to say that once you believe, eternal life is yours. Because it's not simply a quantity of life, it's a quality of life. A new life available through the Spirit for this present age. Working itself out and perfected in eternity. But do you have eternal life now? How do you know? I love what John, the author of our gospel here, he later talked about this in one of his letters. And this is what he said using the exact same language. He said, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Is still there. Is still spiritually dead. Does he say love perfectly? No, he doesn't say love perfectly. But he challenges us to say that if you've passed into life, there's a quality and nature to this new life. It's new life from God who himself is love. And if that's true, then love will begin to come out through you in your life as the Holy Spirit works that through you. Perfectly? No. In fits and starts? Probably. Growing? Yes. Being sanctified, becoming more like Jesus in the way that you love others, especially the body of Christ? Absolutely. It's evidence of that new life that you have passed from death into new life. You see, aren't all of us at the outset opponents of Jesus like these Jewish leaders? From the outset, aren't we all opponents? We don't want anybody trying to, trying to be Lord over our life. That job is reserved for numero uno right here. I got things under control. I don't need you, Jesus, King Jesus. Try and extend your kingdom into my, my little area of control. You see, we're all opponents of Jesus. We're all enemies of God, as Paul would describe us. Romans 5. So we need to know how we've passed from death to life. John gives us one indicator there in 1 John 3, 14. But I think our main passage here in John 5, where we've camped out this morning, John chapter 5, verses 19 through 30, I think our main passage also challenges us in terms of what eternal life looks like in the here and now. How do we know if we've passed from death into life? Remember that when Jesus talks here about himself as the son, he's not talking about the pre-existent word who was with God the Father in the beginning. He's talking about himself as the very human son of man who is at the same time the son of God. Why is that an important clarification to bring back up for you? Because as such, Jesus is, embodies for us what it means to be perfectly human. Jesus embodies for us what it means to be perfectly human. He is fully as we should fully be. Do you believe that? He is fully as we should fully be. If you do believe that, then we need to look at his example here, what he teaches us about being a son. Later in the same gospel, Jesus would tell Mary Magdalene after his resurrection, I am ascending to my father and your father. To my God, says Jesus, and your God. You hear that humanity of Jesus, right? The son of Mary and Joseph, you hear that coming out? Good Jewish confession. My Father, your Father, my God, your God. The reality that the divine Son, the God-man, Jesus, the reality that he came to make us sons and daughters is a point well attested in the New Testament. It's all over the place. 
that we are sons and daughters of God through the work of Jesus. In light of that precious truth, I think that we can ask this question. What does Jesus, the Son, reveal in John 5 about being a son or daughter of God? If you believe you have passed from death into life already, that you are in eternal life now, that you possess eternal life now, that means you're a son or daughter of God. Therefore, you can look to Jesus, the one who is perfectly human, to recognize from him and see in him what it means to truly be a son of God, a daughter of God. What do we see here? Let's finish this morning by allowing ourselves to be encouraged and instructed by Jesus' example by three statements, being a son statements that Jesus expresses here in the bookends. The brackets, verse 19 and verse 30. First, what do we see in verse 19? But really express, I like, I like the words of verse 30. It's this, I can do nothing on my own. Is that your confession? Do you wake up in the morning saying, Father, I can do nothing on my own. If Jesus Christ could confess that, why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't I all the more confess that? I can do nothing on my own. A son or daughter of God makes this confession regularly. Why is that? Well, it's the humility that Jesus spoke about. It's the humility that he spoke about in Matthew 18, 4. He said, whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be a child like? It means to have that humility that recognizes you can't do anything on your own, that you desperately need help from the one who is greater than you. In one sense, of course, this is true in every way. I can do nothing on my own. Even my ability to get out of bed in the morning is a result of the grace, grace of God in my life. Amen? All of it is. But I wouldn't want that to become a caricature so that you feel, per, you know, paralyzed like, I can't do anything on my own. Please, Lord, give me a sign. Please do this. Please send, uh, I don't feel this. I don't, oh, and people get into this weird caricature of a spiritual life that they label godly. So in one sense, yes, this is true in every way. But I think Jesus is speaking here in the context about carrying out the eternal purposes of God. I can do nothing on my own, says Jesus. Is that what you believe? Is that your confession each day? Number two. We see from the second half of verse 19 that a son or daughter can do only what he sees the father doing. We can do only what we see the father doing. When we recognize that we are but children, it should drive us toward Paul, the Apostle Paul's charge in Ephesians 5, verse 1. What did Paul say there? He said this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. If you are a child, you're called to follow your father's lead. To imitate him. To imitate him in every way. But you might say, well, pastor, I, I want to imitate Christ. Don't you know that Christ was imitating the father? <laughs> That's exactly what he said in our passage this morning. He's looking to the father. He's looking to the Father's lead, and as we look to him, we see the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, he said in John chapter 14. Each day we have a choice, biblically. We have a choice to either be conformed to the world or to imitate the Father, to imitate God. That's it. You're either conformed to the world or you are imitating God. We need to know that that crucible is out there. As soon as you walk out the door, you're presented with that choice. Even in this place, you're presented with that choice. Is it your desire to be like the Heavenly Father? As Jesus indicates here, we can only do so when we are looking at what the Father is doing. I love that encouragement. Uh, the Son sees what the Father is doing. With eyes of faith, you and I should be looking at what the Father is doing. 
Do you see what God is doing in the pages of Scripture? When you read the Word, when you dig into it, do you see the purposes of God being carried out? Or are you just looking for moral information, moralizing to change your behavior? No, you've got to see the unfolding drama of redemption, the great work of God, the mission of God, the Missio Dei being carried out from Old Testament to New Testament to see Jesus Christ fulfilling the Father's plan and how that work was being carried out by his followers, by the church. To understand that and to be invested in that and say, I see what you're doing, Father. Do you see God at work around you in your life? Do you see God at work in the world? It's really sad to me that so many Christians are being pulled in this Christian nationalist trend where they think that political priorities are the same as the priorities of the kingdom of God. And they focus on all this minutia and trivia and what they're doing is missing in the process the beautiful, amazing, and often hidden things that God is doing in the lives of ordinary people all over the world that are not affected by the machinations of Washington or Phoenix or Sacramento or wherever. The kingdom of God transcends the empires of this world. It always has. God's at work as if it were a divine conspiracy working itself out like yeast or leaven in a, in a batch of dough, slowly, slowly, slowly infusing its way, like a small tree that starts out as the smallest thing and then grows into something so glorious that all the birds of the air come and land in its branches. Do you see what the Father is doing all around you? I would guess we're too busy watching TV or watching our phones in many cases to stop and think about what God is doing, how he's at work, how he's always been at work, whether in our life or the lives of the people around us. What is God doing? I see that. I see that. I see that. Forgive me, Father, that I missed it. I was so consumed with all of this stuff that in the end does not matter. And I miss your glorious work in that brother's life, that sister's life, in my life. You see, the child sees what the father is doing. He wants to follow. He wants to be like the father. He can only do what he sees the father doing. And number three, back to verse 30. I seek not my own will, says Jesus, but the will of him who sent me. When we are humble enough to say, I can do nothing on my own, only what I see the Father doing, that confession has to be informed and fueled by this desire to do, above all, what God wants, not what I want. You've got to want what God wants. Sometimes we want what we want, but we want God to do it. We want God to want it. Right? We want God to do it for us and we try to conform God to what we want rather than saying, no, 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 I want what you want. It's what Jesus prayed, didn't he, in the garden? Not, your will be, not my will be done, but your will be done. God is your father. We want his will because he is our good father, but also because we understand that we, yes, us, you, yes, you, have been, carry, have been sent to carry out the eternal purposes of God. Do you understand that? Do you, do you believe that about yourself? Do you say about yourself, like maybe in like the description on Twitter or whatever the social media, you, get, you know, you get like, I don't know how many words to say, like who you are. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a whatever, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm a whatever. Does it say... One sent to carry out the eternal purposes of God. You, you might get dinged for that, maybe, right? Like, oh boy, <laughs> wow, magnanimous. Like, uh, this guy really think, thinks a lot about himself. But brothers and sisters, that is beautifully biblical. You have been sent to carry out the purposes. You have been sent to carry out. You have been sent to carry out the purposes of God. Therefore we say, I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
How do I know this? Because Jesus told his, his followers this. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And what are we doing as the church? We're simply carrying on the work of Jesus. Same work he began. We're carrying out in light of the cross now. We should pray like Jesus prayed. Not my will, but your will be done. There were, of course, let me qualify this at the end. There were, of course, there are, of course, unique aspects of what Jesus is confessing here in John 5. Unique aspects in terms of his relationship with the Father. I'm not trying to say that all of us are exactly like Jesus in our relationship to the Father. But the parallels are there. What we see from the Son, we are called to follow him. We want to live out. Therefore, may each and every one of us May we be encouraged in light of the sunly example of Jesus, right? The sunly example of Jesus, that we would be encouraged to pray for this heart, the heart that says, I can do nothing on my own, Father, only what I see you doing, for I am not come to do my own will, but to do the will of you, the one who sent me. Wow, what a daily prayer that could be. It should be for us that we would pray for this heart and that we would live from this heart to be a daughter, to be a son like the son. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together.